Dory 1, this is Fire Team Delta. Dad's coming home. Welcome to the Military Veteran Dad Podcast, where it is our mission to bring every dad home. I am your host, Ben Colloy. I'm a United States Marine veteran, husband, and a father. We will bring authentic conversations to inspire action in your life so we can close the gap between the dad you are today and the dad you want to be tomorrow. This is the Military Veteran Dad Podcast. Welcome back to Military Veteran Dad, episode 80. If you can hear the sound of my voice, it was one of those mornings where I woke up with a sinus infection and the universe decided it was going to test me a little bit more. So without further ado, I'm going to get started right away with Joseph Medina, who is a Marine Brigadier General retired. And this episode is going to rock and I will see you on the other side. Welcome to the podcast, Joseph. I'm glad to be here today, Ben. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you and, and all the veterans that are listening in. This episode is going to be super special because, dads, we have a retired Brigadier General Marine officer on the podcast today who has a depth and wisdom to his life that is going to rival many of the dads that we've had here on before, and he's going to crack open a lot of spaces that we don't talk about at dinner parties. And I, this conversation, I know, is going to help a lot of dads come home Joseph, if you could go ahead and tell a little bit about your career, the highlight reel, a little bit of your story, your family. I know you've got two families that you've gone through in your time in the Marine Corps and that you're in now still living through. So go ahead and just unpack a little bit about that for us. Okay, Ben. Yeah, uh, you mentioned, uh, I hope to share some wisdom with you. And you learn wisdom not from doing everything right. You learn wisdom from the mistakes that you made uh, and getting getting over them. So I grew up... Uh, you know, my father came and mother both came from very poor families. My father enlisted in the army and uh, stayed in until he retired. Found out later he wanted to be a Marine, but he, he served in the army because uh, he wasn't eligible, eligible to get into the Marine Corps at that time. <clears throat> but uh, so I lived uh, the family of a of enlisted soldier going around the world, living in uh, the Republic of China, living in Panama, living at, at uh, army bases throughout throughout the country. So that was my experience. Um, I, I then did, after getting accepted to the Naval Academy and, and going through that program, became a Marine officer. And <clears throat> I got my number one MOS that I wanted, which was being an infantry Marine, mainly because I could be in contact with more, a, a greater number of, of Marines. And that's where I thrived in my time is, is being with and uh, leading leading Marines. I served in uh, every division, every active division we have, uh, most of the regiments. I was a battalion commander and regimental XO for 2nd Marines, regimental commander for 3rd Marines, uh, company commander and 4th Marines, uh, company commander and operations officer in Marines. I was a battalion commander assigned uh, with the 6th Marines at some period of time and also with the 9th Marines at Camp Hansen twice. So I, as you see, I've been around. I did five tours in Okinawa. Uh, I did uh, command. Uh, <clears throat> my second to last uh, command was actually with Expedition, Expeditionary Strike Group 3. Um, we made a deployment to the North Arabian Gulf and did some operations during the, uh, during the 2004 uh, time period. From there, I went to the base where I commanded the base, uh, Marine Corps Base Camp Butler in Okinawa. Uh, that was my final assignment in Okinawa, uh, and then and then went back to the to the FMF side and and a MEF commander and deputy MEF commander uh, for uh, three MEF and for a short period of time the, the division commander uh, and Marine Corps for the GE and another group called the LA group managing field engineers where I did a lot of what uh, I did in the Marine Corps I recruited, trained, uh, and then deployed. Uh, field engineers to various hotspots in the world to take care of a problem. So for me, it was it was a lot of similarity uh, with like being 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 a marine. So that's my that's my background. Then, what about your family? What, what did your family look like through all of those different tours? While I was a marine, uh, I had uh, two kids, one uh, a major, and we traveled throughout different parts of the world. Uh, I made several several deployments with with my uh, with my kids uh, one boy and one girl and you know aside from UDPs uh, a time 
time at Guantanamo Bay. I did the uh, my one of my trips to to Iraq with the uh, in the North Arabian Gulf that time with kids. It's you know there are a lot of difficulties you know being separated. You know it is very tough uh, when you're married and you have to leave your wife. And you have to leave your children for six months to a year or for any, any, any long, any length of time. Got out. Uh, I, <clears throat> I have been uh, remarried now and have another set of kids. Um, and I did travel uh, up until recently. I did travel fairly often, but it was a lot different. I normally travel during the week. I was normally back at least during the weekend. So I wasn't gone for extended periods of time. That part isn't there. I, I very seldom miss any key dates. I could plan around them, like birthdays and holidays. But in the Marine Corps, even if you're not deployed, for example, I was on, I was with Fifth Marines uh, for three years at uh, one time from 85 to starting about 85 to 88. We bought a house out in, in, in that area. And although I was there for over three years, I, you know, my diary reflected that I slept in my house less than a hundred nights. That's just a little, little over three months in three years because uh, the two deployments to Okinawa was one thing. And then uh, we went out to the 29 Palms more than, I mean, twice for CAXs and multiple other times. We we're out in the field all the time doing, doing different field training exercises, et cetera. The amount of time you're gone is, is a lot and you miss a lot of, milestones with your with your kids and that's that becomes pretty hard to do sometimes how'd you work through like because as dads that guilt can really kick in and eat us up on the inside how did you balance being strong and strengthful towards your marines at the same time recognizing you have an inner battle of being human on the inside that's a dichotomy sometimes that you have to master and it's, it's tough to do you do have to be strong but but at the same time I've always felt that I, I didn't treat my Marines as if they, they, they were my subjects. I treated my Marines as if they were, generally speaking, my younger brothers and, and cousins and nephews. So, yeah, you still have to be the disciplinarian, but not – I see good discipline is when people do things and, and is not – punishment is not part of – is not really discipline to me. So – you know, that's that's the one thing. But it is one example, though, that I would bring to mind. When I was the, the base CG, the base uh, um, inspector general worked for me. And one time he came in and said, uh, you know, he wanted to alert me to a problem that one of the Marines on the base was having. Now, he wasn't one of my Marines. He was a sergeant major assigned to one of the, the MEF units at the time. And I knew the sergeant major, and I knew the unit. It was uh, one of the battalions there. And the sergeant major had made, already made a deployment with the battalion and was, was getting ready to, was planning for the next rotation, was making another deployment with the battalion. And the problem was he was having family issues that had rise to the attention of the inspector, the, the base IG. And one of his sons was having problems in school. And those types of problems eventually sometimes rise to the IG level if there's an, an issue and that sort of thing. Since I knew the sergeant major and I knew the battalion commander, you know, I asked him to visit me in the office to talk about the issue, which I did. He had such a close relationship with his battalion commander, he asked to bring him along too. So he, he did. So and I did talk to the sergeant major in private and I talked to the battalion commander as well and said, Most Marines will recognize that. They see Marines that are just gung-ho and will always spend their time out there. And there's sometimes they've got to pull back and spend time with their family and at home. I, I took a lesson on another regard for that. When I was working at, at 2nd Marines, a regimental commander who has remained a lifelong friend to this day would never come into the office before 8 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it was 8, 8.30 when he would show up. He wouldn't show up unless there was an event, a major event that 
he was involved in. And anybody knows this guy. And he also normally left fairly early, 7, 16, 30, 1700. You know, if anybody that knew this Marine knew that, you know, he always he did a lot of work aside from that. But his point, what he his lesson to me goes for our Marines too, is if he he's in the office, other people will, be, will make sure they're in the office before him. And if he stays late, they're gonna stay late just because of the hip. He would rather make sure push them out to spend time with their families. And that's one thing, both in the military side and the civilian world, we need to make sure that we we're taking care of our people, making sure they have time to take care of their family and their family needs. A Marine's family ha is having issues. You may think you're getting 100% out of that Marine, but it, you're not. And the other thing is it may eventually get rise to the problem, like I mentioned with the Sergeant Major, that a, you know his, his son was soon to be going to get kicked out of school, potentially get arrested by local authorities for different things. So those are types of things that he needed, he personally needed to be involved in. And because of his commitment to this training cycle and that training cycle, you know, it's it's tough to do to to make time, but we, we need we need to make sure we do that. You hit a couple of things that I want to make sure the dads out there listening picked up on is the time component. Because as a Marine where you, you are gung ho and you do get super excited and you can just scream oora and just identify with that energy really quickly. It's very easy to get hooked on that as a drug and it's easy to get to hide in it as well because no one's going to call your BS for being a great Marine. The more you're a Marine, the more people are going to look up to you, but you can also use that to hide. There's several Marines out there listening to this or anybody in the military that probably uses their active duty to hide from whatever is at home that really scares the hell out of them. And that time is so important because at the, something we talk about often is kids spell love, T-I-M-E. And oftentimes when they're acting up, it's a deficit of time. And that's what you were picking up as an early indicator. And as an officer, you could easily dismiss that and be like, you're a Marine. This stuff is what's important. The mission comes first. And then two weeks later, you're dealing with a phone call from the Secretary of State because you have an international incident on Okinawa when really you had a warning sign to pick up on it. And that's what you need to have that sixth sense as a, an officer or anybody that leads other people. Because if people aren't connected at home with their family, they are not going to be connected at work. And if they are appearing to be, it's just a facade and they've just gotten really good at looking like it's all together. But if you know or you don't create a space where family can exist with the equal priority to what you create, you're asking for disaster. You're asking for domestic abuse, to violence, all the things that get create and escalate problems like that all happens when those early warning signs of what really matters, which is your family, are ignored. I want to follow up with a question. So there's lots of officers out there listening to this message and a lot of staff NCOs and all the different branches of the military. What was kind of one philosophy that you always wanted to teach your junior officers and enlisted staff NCOs about family? Like what was some like mantra maybe that you instilled to help them understand what priority was or to keep in the back of their head? I guess one thing is whatever you do, you know, what you, you truly do and, and not what you put on the facade of doing is what eventually your, your Marines and your family are going to emulate. If you, you know, fly off the handle and, and do whatever, then, then your Marines will eventually do the same thing. It's the same thing on your, on your family likes. You can't just talk the talk. You got to walk the walk. I mean, you, you can't just say one thing, but you got to act, you know, uh, appropriately act out what you're, what you're doing. So that's uh, one bit of advice. The, the other thing I used to, uh, I had a group of sayings uh, that was called uh, Medina's Maxims. Uh, one of them was, uh, if you, if you wrestle with a pig, the pig likes it, you just get dirty. And I've used that aside from being in the Marine Corps. I also used it in my business side too. That saying is that if you do something unethical, okay, because somebody draws you to it, then you now, aside from the other people that's being unethical, you are in that position. An example that I, I've used uh, in the business side, uh, I had a, a manager, field service manager that worked for me. With the, one of the sales managers continually arguing with him about some issue. And he flew off the handle and wrote a little note to him that said something like, well, if you want to do this job, you go ahead and do it. 
So then the sales manager then takes that email and forwards it up up the business chain of command. And believe me, there's still a chain of command in the business side too. Uh, it may be hidden by suits, but it's it's more rigid than even in the military. Uh, so when I go get the story behind it, well, you ought to see the email trail from the sales manager of all the things he was saying. But it doesn't matter, you know. Once the once you give into that urge and then you do something um, that is not not right, then all of a sudden you're down in the dirt, you know, with the rest of them. And, and you know, like I said, the, the pigs like it. You just get dirty. So that's an example I've used. Is always try to do the right thing, even when it's hard. And, and believe me. I do try, but I've made mistakes myself. Like I said, I, I've learned I've learned through some black eyes of, of things that uh, when I flew off, I didn't read the email before pressing the send button. Yeah, when you get caught up in the emotions or when someone fires something at you and gets you all fired up or triggers even something maybe from your past that maybe you haven't dealt with. And I always kind of like the lead by like the right thing is always worth doing, even if it's not popular. Like if it feels like the right thing, then that's probably the thing that you should, you should do. And your story kind of reminded me of a Zig Ziglar story that he tells in some of his speeches that he has recorded now where a, a boss yelled at his secretary and then he continues this chain, like the secretary yelled to someone and then it just continued like five people. And then this mom went home and made dinner and just lit into her kids because someone five people away started yelling and taking out their frustration. Like all of those bad choices have consequences. And just because you don't see it doesn't matter. And I think as Marines, we are as service members in general, we have this idea that we can use our ego to kind of overinflate who we are to, to get the results within our unit that we need. But what people don't realize is even when you don't say something, you're still saying something. And oftentimes your demeanor, your mannerisms, the way you the inflection in your voice, those things say things. Or even something as simple as sending an email at seven o'clock at night. You're setting a bar that you want your employees to reply at seven o'clock at night and that their family time with whatever they're doing doesn't matter. Like every one of those is something you're doing, whether you're consciously choosing or not, you're still setting some example that they're going to follow. So I love that advice there. I want to maybe go towards a different angle. You have two marriages, right? You had the first one that you ended, ended and you had two kids and now you're on your second marriage, correct? That's correct, yes. And you have two kids now that are younger as well, if I remember, in kindergarten. Uh, I have one in kindergarten, yeah. I got one, well, she's almost in first grade. <laughs> yeah. And then I have one in middle school, and then I have one in high school. I have three, three a freshman in high school. So I have three, they're all about five years, about five years apart. So, so you kind of get one of those unique opportunities where you get a do-over, where you get a chance to kind of take the lessons from the first one, and then retry to change how you show up. What's something that the Joseph from the first marriage and showing up as a Marine in those kids' lives, and then what's something you try to do differently now that maybe you could share a lesson within that um, getting a chance to do it over? A very good question. I would say 90% of what I do, I don't do differently. There's opportunities that I didn't have. There are a few things that I do differently. Not, not. I think most of the way I, I interact with my family and with uh, with my kids in particular is generally the, the same. But I, what I have the opportunity to do that I didn't is to be around more. Okay. The one thing I that I do differently though is I I don't know how much leave I really ever took while I was in the Marine Corps. I, I, my leave was when I was doing PCS moves and you move, move, move. <laughs> We're on a U-Haul driving across to wherever the yeah, Marine Corps told us to go. And, and when you when you when you get out of the Marine Corps too, you know you you know you you lose your leave after sixty days, I think it is, uh, unless you have combat save leave, then you can they pile it up. Well, I had combat save leave, but if you that only lasts for one year. So when I became the base commander. By anything over sixty days, I lost. So I, I mean, I I don't know how much leave I lost. So so I lost a lot of leave. I didn't take that many vacation vacations with my family. Like the story I was saying earlier, I I probably prioritized the Marine Corps more over my family than I mean, and because I was a motivated Marine, I that, that was I tried to I was paying attention to my family too, but 
I can honestly say that that I probably put the Marine Corps ahead of my family on a few occasions when I probably should have. Now, now take it now that I'm in the business side. I have taken my my leave. I do and take my time off and my leave when I was uh, with those the, the GE and, and the LA group. I did go on vacations. You know, uh, you know, I was based in Manila for several years, and then Singapore. We went to Hong Kong Disneyland. I took the family to to uh, to uh, to Italy to see the Vatican, and, and my, my little daughter still enjoys. You know, let's go to the hotel. You know, she enjoys vacation. So, I would say even active duty Marines should take their leave that that they're granted. Don't do what I did, and, and I probably learned that from my father too, because you know, as we were talking earlier, you know, enlisted Marines, enlisted soldiers can save the leave. And what my father used to do, which you can't do anymore, is every four years when his enlistment, when you re-enlisted, you could sell back leave. And he would sell back, you know, almost four years of leave in order to, and that money he would take to buy a new car or to put down a down payment for a new car. So that's how we got our new cars at that time. Now they, they've done away with that program where you can't say, sell back leave, I, I believe. But that used to be, you know, a savings plan for for a lot of uh, enlisted Marines and soldiers. And I think what you're you're speaking to this idea, and it's kind of interesting in the military because in the when you're in a unit, I remember I had this, I was in my unit for three years in Okinawa. You get the feeling, just like at work, there's no place, this, there's no way this place would survive without me. I've got to put in the work because no one else is going to do it. But in every transition, every time you leave, the unit doesn't explode. Some other person steps into your place and fills it up every time. It happens thousands of times across the military every day. But yeah, we internalize that we've got to do the work because no one else is going to get it done. And that internalization that we need to be there justifies that time without our kids. Like there's a statistic that usually scares dads when I bring it up, but when you're kids are born, you only get 18 summers with them before they're off on their own. And that's a really small number. Everybody can quantify 18 in their head. We're not talking like trying to imagine what a trillion dollars of the government's money look like. We're talking about 18 summers, 18 summers to do something fun with them. And if you, if you figure it out when they're 18, that like all that's gone, like that's 18 times you had a chance to invest, take a vacation And it doesn't have to be complicated. Like we took a vacation last summer to Florida and my kids talk about more about the airplane ride than they do about the resort that we stayed at on the beach. They'll always find the fun in the little things. And it, we have to make sure that time investment is there because we often, what we also forget is the commitments to the Marine Corps and everything else work. It's all temporary. It has a timeline of an end date, no matter where you're at, at some point it will end. But the connection with your kids, the memories with your wife, those are forever. And we don't frame life often enough like that, that the priorities reply, how far have I committed? Well, I've committed to my wife for the rest of my life. So that needs to be number one. My kids, that relationship is going to be with me till the day I die. And that needs to be number two. And then everything else can be after that. But the other commitments are just temporary. Our service in the military is temporary. Our service in, in a corporate job. It's all just temporary and it can all go away, but your commitment with your family is the one that keeps on going. Yeah, I, you you had two key points, I believe, Ben. And one, one of them is, yeah, it's the time, the quality time that you spend with them. And now, certainly, you know, you're going to make some deployments, you're going to make certain required training events, but you know, there are pre-deployment lead periods. You should take, you need to take advantage of those and spend the quality time. You know, one of the, and the two fondest memories I have with my my son, my older son, is first when he was, I don't know, seven years old, six years old, seven years old, you know, teaching him to ride the bike. He was a quick learner, very athletic, so he he quickly learned to ride the bike. Then I would go, you know, jogging with him, and he would ride the. Maybe he was only in kindergarten, but you know, he would he could ride that bike farther than I could run. That was one thing. The other thing was when I took over the the, the base. Before I went out there, you know, General Blackman, who was the, the mess CG at the time, who I'd known for many, many years, called me up and said, hey, do you know how to golf? And my answer was, 
I know, I, but I, I don't know how to golf. He goes, well, you know, as a base CG, that's going to be one of your big things. You, you're going to have the golf course, plus you're going to have to do some golfing with the Japanese, so you better learn. So, uh, you know, I, I did. That was one of the periods of time when I, uh, when I left my previous command to Okinawa two weeks early, and general officers do not do not like – it is almost forbidden – for another general officer that's coming in to take his to arrive early. So I, I told the guy I was arriving with, I said, don't worry about me. I, me and the family, we're going to go in the BOQ room. You won't see us for two weeks. We won't be in your hair. And, uh, and I will take those two weeks and learn to golf. And I did that. I, I signed up for golfing lessons with, and, and with me and my son, who was, I think he was 14 or 15 at the time. And we took golfing lessons together. And to this day, you know, a lot of times when we, we meet, we'll, we'll go and have a round of golf. And back then, well, I, I don't smoke cigars anymore, but I used to smoke cigars. And I would, my excuse was it would keep the bugs away when I was mowing the grass or, or when I was golfing. But, uh, yeah, we, we, learned to, we learned to golf out there. So that, that quality time, you, you do that. The other thing you mentioned is the feeling that you're invincible, that you're, in, you're indispensable. And if you are indispensable then your organization's got a problem but there are a lot of organizations that feel that way the the leader you know the manager or the leader feels he has to control everything and as waiting the the, the units that i've seen that that have the the most difficult time in a crisis situation are those that have been over overly controlled by one or two people and and uh <clears throat> you know when i uh, when I was the regimental commander, I had great battalion commanders. Several of them are, are, are general officers right now had been my battalion commanders, <clears throat> including Jody Osterman and, and Castelvi and, and a few others. <clears throat> but I had one who I won't mention, tried to manage and control everything that was going on in his, his battalion. And, and I, <clears throat> we, I, he, we went out for a field exercise once. I gave him a tactical problem to go do. And, uh, you know, he was trying to stay up for four days at a, at a run. He wasn't going to go to sleep, you know. So, and I told him his, his unit, his battalion was having a problem functioning because they would function better if he weren't there than if he was there. Because he was trying to control it. He trying to control everything. Everything slowed down. So that's a, it's, a, it's the same thing. You need to, like I, I mentioned before, the regional commander that came in late and, and went home early, but he was trying to, get his people to basically push leadership management down, let others do their, do their job and then have more time with their, with their family as well. That story reminds me of the supply officer from Heartbreak Ridge. <laughs> yeah. The guy who became the, yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, those, those people sometimes do, do exist. And I, but it's worse in the civilian and the private sector. You know, you, some of those people, and there's a there's a good book by Stephen Cotter. Uh, it's about a 30 year old book on uh, managing and leadership. And and his, he's got a couple. He's he is one of the key guys in business leadership. And his one of his books is, is strictly on the difference between management managers and leaders. Now a lot of leaders have to be managers as well, but managers focus on on efficiency and getting things done at the least cost, not with a long-term vision and powering you know, leadership down below them. So you want your leader to have vision. He still has to get things done optimally, but that's what you see in a lot of businesses today that focus on short-term. They want to you know, increase short-term stock price, not five-year, 10-year growth of the company, which means you have to invest in your employees. So I don't know how we got on that topic. But we got there because oftentimes people forget that they are replaceable and that the commitments with your family are not. And there's a simple concept that I tried to describe this time and investment. And in the military, you have to go away and you have to do things. You need to treat it like a credit card. And if you've got a $20,000 credit card limit of time with your family, when you come back, you got to pay that back with interest. And if you don't, it'll eventually go bankrupt. Eventually, that bit, a card can no longer have any more time borrowed. And either you get re ejected from your family's life 
or you end up getting in, in a life that you don't actually want. You don't even know how you got there, but it's that credit card of time and you can borrow from it. Like you're required to in the military That's what the military sets you up for, but you have to pay it back with time. And if you always think of it as a credit card, it's always something you got to make that payment on. It's not just about the minimum payment. It's about making sure you pay back that entire loan with the interest that you borrowed because that's really where you can make sure that you're living that balanced life and that on the other side of service, you still have an enriched family that understands you and connects with you and isn't something that they want to not have anything to do with you because you've always been there. And when you were home, they remember how present you were and they understood when you had to go away, but they were looking forward to when daddy came home because that's when he comes in. That's when he shines. That's when he steps into his best self. And that's when you can really step into that, still be the best version of yourself as a dad but still honor the commitment that you have to do in part of your military service. That's a, that's a good analogy. But I, but I also would add, it is very difficult sometimes, and especially in the last several years, when we've had continuous operational deployments and combat deployments into Afghanistan and Iraq. It, you know, when you come back from a training evolution, it's a lot easier or to disengage than when you come back from an operational deployment, particularly a combat deployment. And, and that becomes uh, rather tough. I heard somebody say once, you know, when you're over there, you continue thinking about being home. But when you're home, you're continually thinking about being over there. And you spend so long, you spend months at a time training to get over there, but you spend days coming home. Yes. Just a, a mindset of some of, you know, the Marine, after they Marines and other service members as well, but after they've you know lived in, in austere conditions for so long, you know just the on edge and the mentality, and then then you you come back to stateside where it, it almost seems like it, it never existed before. It it, it becomes it, it is difficult, and and we are. I mean that's one reason we're having problems with family issues with suicide. And that sort of thing, and and that's that, that's a hard, hard thing to deal with. I mean, I had at my at my uh, job that I recently had with with Elliot, uh, where I handled global field services. I had a in the U.S. a, a one of my field service managers managing a, a pretty big team of engineers. Uh, he was prior Army uh, and made uh, several deployments to. To uh, Afghanistan as well, and he, you know, he was still having he was having some aggression issues, temper issues, and, and that sort of thing. And, and and this is this was he was a pretty big guy, pretty still very fit. Uh, uh, and the only reason that that's important was he scared the hell out of some of, his, some of the people that, that that he worked with when he, when they he would start he would sometimes he would <clears throat> close his door, slam his door, and start yelling at nobody but himself so to speak so i was able to i talked to him and got him hooked up with some you know va counseling and that sort of thing a uh, great guy uh but but it is something that that we need to recognize and and deal with but yeah it is for an aspect of you know when you're here you're here when you're there you're there but it is it is difficult sometimes to disengage the mind Mm -hmm. And it is difficult when the, the war isn't ending or it hasn't ended yet at the time of this recording because there's still someone over there fighting. And when you feel like a brotherhood, that question of like, I left my brothers behind, it doesn't matter whether you're in a different unit, you're all part of brothers, no matter what unit you are, or what branch of military. And that can be very difficult. And the best way that I've been able to help dads frame it is that you always have to treat it as a gift, whether someone died over there that was your friend or whether someone over still there is fighting the, your, the good fight. They're fighting it so you have the chance to be dad. And when your turn to go back, it's their turn to be dad. And that's really, you have to frame it as a gift. Like your friend, if he'd passed, like he passed and gave you an opportunity to be the best fucking dad you could be. And if he was a dad too, like that means you need to be a dad two times as strong and live up to that, that gift. And that feeling that his kids no longer get to feel now that his dad's gone. And you can use your opportunity as a dad to really take everything that's sad that happened and really take it as a gift. Like I have an amazing opportunity that my brothers have given me to be an amazing dad, to step in, to create an amazing adult. And that can really give you that peace to 
move from like, why did it happen? But like, okay, this is something that I can move forward with to be a great dad and create good adults. Yeah, it's also very difficult for the children too. You know, they that that have parents that are that are over there. Sometimes it's difficult just to be separated. Uh, I know there's a lot more mothers that are serving nowadays, uh, and 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 that is. And in fact, uh, my wife's got a, a good friend that's a, an army nurse, and she has got a couple small children. You know, she when she goes out on on her, her, her training evolutions or, or you going on a very short deployment, but still, you know, she's leaving small children at home. And if you're going to a combat environment, you know, particularly when these kids are, I, you know, are of that age, you know, when they start thinking about, you know, you know what, you know, what danger is there, is their parents involved in? So, um, in some ways it's, it helps being in a military community, Community, like when you're in Oakland, like when you're in a Camp Lejeune or, or Camp Pendleton, where the military families get together and they can, in some ways, that's helpful to work support group. But in other ways, it's not because, you know, then if there's anything that happens over there, it gets amplified sometimes and, and, the, and the news chain turns into a rumor circle. And sometimes that, that, that hurts more than helps. That's really great, great perspective there because the kids understand more than we believe and we don't give them credit for enough. And especially military kids, they grow up faster than every other kid has to. They learn lessons that most people don't even learn their entire life. And they deal with the idea of grief before they even ever have to, or should have to as a kid, like that innocence can be taken away so quickly. But the part that I think what you hit it on there, when you hit it with your golf story, that when you're home, you have to create those core memories because those core memories will be the memory that they go to, to reconnect and live with that. That if you didn't come home, if something would have happened to you in one of your mini deployments, that memory of you going golfing, that simple memory of you going golfing, that would have been what he, your, your son would have remembered. And he probably would have kept going golfing to remember that feeling of being with dad and that he would have always done that to be with dad. And if he ever wants a moment to understand what would dad do, He's probably going to go to the golf course. So that's why it's so important to create those meaningful memories when you come home, because it's that that memory that you don't think will be special that becomes special through this perspective of time, like golfing. Like I'm sure your son still talks about it. And that's still something he looks forward to doing with his dad because he remembers that feeling that you had together with presence and just being one-on-one. Like that's how you can kind of create it as the deal with that economy of fatherhood and military service is make sure you create those core memories because that will become the legacy they remember you by. And there was a dad or a, a, a wife that I interviewed last summer. Her husband died in a naval or a scuba diving accident in Hawaii. He lived a life with no bucket list. He actually PCS to Hawaii on a sailboat from Los Angeles with a bunch of other guys. And like that was always how he lived his life. And when he passed away, she essentially took that method and they continued to live life with no bucket list. And as I was interviewing, I was like, how beautiful is that? That And her kids were young, like five and four and like six months old. Actually, I wasn't even born yet. She was still six months in the pregnant yet. They, those kids have a blueprint of how to live life like dad. And they got that because of how dad lived when he was here and when he was present. And that can be so beautiful when you, when you go to the other side and when you maybe don't get to come back home, making sure that you made those anchor memories where they mattered. Those can be the little things that make sure your kids have those anchor points that keep on continuing them to let them know and grow up and to be good adults without getting hung up on what happened to dad. And those happen in the moments where you least expect them. I'm sure when you did that golfing, you had no idea the consequences and the, and the positive repercussions that could happen from just learning you how to golf so that way you could have good relations with the Japanese. But that created one of the strongest memories you probably have with your son now that uh, you can do together. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, you, you term that, and I hadn't heard it before, anchor memories, but that's very, that's very good. I mean, at the time, I did not know how meaningful that would be. I mean, we did, we did do that, that training, but after that, then it always gave us something to do. You know, when, when you're, you know, when your kids are very small, yeah, you can, there's a lot of simple things you can do with them, but when they get older, um, when he was, when he was uh, in high school, and then even when he was going to the academy, when I would visit him, that gave us something we could do together is, is to go golfing where, you know, 
yeah, you're going to ride around in a cart together, spend a lot of time, talk, and, and all that other stuff. But it, it does give you give you something something to do. But, but those anchor memories, as you termed them, are critical. I think when you when you look back, you know how you spend your 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 time with your your kids. Like right now during that pandemic, with my with my my youngest, you know, I I I, I she, she's still going through school over there doing out online classroom. So I spend my a lot of time with her doing her Google Classroom. I'm her Google Classroom teacher. So you know that's that that's, that's time we, we can spend together. So and they're always gonna remember like I don't know how they're gonna remember coronavirus time frame, but I've been it's been my mission to make sure they remember as a positive one. And this journey for me really started last summer. My wife went to China and for 10 days and I took vacation. I had the a good amount of vacation built up. And I was like, I'm going to be a stay-at-home dad for 10 days on my own. I'm gonna, my Taking vacation was kind of my insurance policy that I wasn't going to try to work and do daycare or something at the same time because that probably would have killed me. So I was like, I'm going to take that and so that I'm just going to go all in, not have to worry about work. But that was some of the best 10 days. That like I had a hangover for probably two months after that. Like I just wanted that those 10 days back. And now in this time frame, I'm without a job. I'm living my life with my podcast and growing it as a business, getting to help my kids like, this is the best time because I've, I'm here, I'm present. I, I make sure every morning I have two hours of my calendar blocked off where I'm just helping them homeschool because that's more important than whatever I'm going to work on in the podcast. And a year from now, 10 years from now, they'll remember that dad was here helping me when I needed him. And you don't know when it's going to matter, but that's what matters most is that you're always trying because at some point, one of those memories is going to be the one that they want to do for more. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, they, they will always remember you for what? And that's the good question. Is it, is it going to be for something positive or is it going to be for something, something negative? So, so I, you know, you try to develop those good anchor memories. Um, and that's, that's where, you know, this, whether it's vacation or whether it's just other time, you know, where you're trying to create some time that, that, you know, the memories that you spend, uh, and sometimes we don't want to spend money on, on that. You know, we want to spend something money on something else, but that will disappear. But yet the, the, the vacation to Florida or the, or where, whatever you do is, is, is certainly going to create some memories that will be long lasting. Yeah. And it can go by a, a flip of a, of a hat. So speaking of memories, I'm not sure where this question is going to go and I'm not sure where, but I have a curiosity for you that I want to kind of just pitch towards you here. So challenge coins are part of something that are in the military. They're part of every branch of service. When you, as a general and an officer and through all the different ranks, handed out challenge coins, did they have a special meeting that you like had as a Marine yourself when you're handing them? Or did you use them in a different way for your own upbringing? Like did a challenge coin mean anything special to you? I have a way, I have a story at the end of this of how that, what they meant for me. So I'm interested to see what yours is first. Um, yeah, I, interesting. I, I spent some time with my joint duty with some of the other services as well. Um, and um, I think the different services have different feelings about, you know, challenge coins. Um, I mean, they, they tend to, to give them out quite frequently, particularly in the Army. And that sort of thing, and and every now everybody's got a challenge coin and everything else. But in in the Marine Corps, they they were a little bit more selective in in um, in what they meant um, and in giving them to someone who did something that was really did something that was meaningful. Um, so uh, yeah, I I mean I I've got a couple collections of of challenge coins. I had one one big collection. Uh, <laughs> interesting, you should mention that. When I got promoted to lieutenant colonel, uh, my son was five years old and my daughter was six years old. When it's a V twenty two pilot now, um, <clears throat> the, the, we had a private ceremony for my promotion, where we went into. The, I was the division operations officer for Second Marine Division. The division commander was General Jones, Jim Jones. So we went into his office to do the promotion ceremony. General Jones had this big coffee table set up, and he had all his challenge coins 
uh, underneath the on the coffee table with a big plate plant of glass over the top of it. So so we go over and we do, you know we do the oath of office where it and I look over at that coffee table and my five year old son has got half his coins out, took his his coins off his table and was playing with them. So I said, "Holy shit, I'm in trouble!" So I I, I look over and and General Joe did. He, he, he took it quite well. He, he was a great man. Um, so, so he, he you know, he, 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 it was more his aide that was, you know, uh, was having a heart attack to, than Jerome Jones. It, it was one the big deal. So, anyway, but I tried to use good, you know, there there was something rather than just going out and giving them out to everybody. You know, normally it was it was there was some meaning behind who you would give the the, the coin to, uh, to to mean different things. So. <clears throat> yeah, and I so I have uh, I had a whole bunch of coins that you know I had left at my my house um, when I went to, to after I got out and went to Manila for a while. And my son's got those, so I have a second set of coins that I've collected. Uh, so, so I have two sets of coins, but some of them are not as meaningful as the ones that that you know who who actually gave it to you, and and there was something behind behind that coin. So I, I still have a, a handful of coins that are, that are meaningful. So I have a particular challenge coin that uh, if you can see it here, it's got a nice Eagle globe and anchor on it on one side, United States Marine on the other side, it's got three MFs uh, symbol with the dragon on it. And I've been trying to ever since we first talked on Monday, I've been trying to remember the Colonel that was in charge of headquarters group during my time. And I yet to, to really remember his name i tried googling it but there wasn't good much history on the the group to, on the internet but that coin i don't remember a lot of why he gave it to me i want to say it was probably out of an exercise we were part of the engineering company that helps make everything happen but i've used this coin because as a dad i've been out for almost 13 years that memory of just being out of dad, leaving the Marine Corps for kind of forgetting what you have in the Marine Corps of what the Marine Corps gave you. Any branch of service gives you. It doesn't matter for the Marine Corps, just my example here. But so often you can get caught up in your own soup of emotions and you can internalize and judge yourself as a failure and define a lot of what you feel right now as permanent. And that coin I started carrying with me for, by the recommendation of a coach that I have. And he's also a Marine. So we kind of did it together. I carried that in my pocket starting in December and I kind of, it reminds me because the Eagle Global Anchor on one side reminds me that I'm a Marine. And then I also remember the moment when the first Eagle Global Anchor was put pressed into my hand at boot camp of how proud I was that feeling. It's almost like an infinite energy source for me to go back to that memory. And I carry it and I grip it in my pocket when I feel the storms inside get really strong. And when I grip it, I remind myself I'm more than the emotions that I'm feeling that I am more than whatever circumstances I am right now. There was a point where that feeling wasn't permanent and I was thanked. I was honored because of this coin. And it always is that it's, it's for me, it's like an anchor memory, but it's like a, it's like sticking a rod in the ground for me to anchor myself in a storm or a strong river because I can stand firm. If I anchor in the strength that is the Marine Corps for me. And for me, the challenge coin is, is a memory going back to when I was more than what I'm feeling today. And that can be very powerful as a tool to get you through whatever you're feeling. Same thing with an anchor memory. If after you pass, your son will use that anchor memory with your, with your son to get you him through something that's hard. All of that was, is super powerful. And it helped me try to get control of my emotions because emotions can be so hard for anybody to deal with, especially as a dad. You got so many mixed ones. Your kids are going crazy. Coronavirus is going crazy. Your world could be crazy. But when I grip that pocket, my coin in my pocket, I I could just remember that I'm a United States Marine and I can do more than I feel like I can today. And I did more. In that memory, I can move out of whatever I'm feeling. That I mean that's a that's a good point. <laughs> I've got a I've got a couple that are especially meaningful. This is this is one when I had the I led the uh, expeditionary strike group. Uh, it was the first time we stood up ESG three. If you if you Google ESG three now, they've changed the logo. Uh, but it it, it had uh, it has the the uh, you see the big three is in, in camouflage is in camouflage. Uh, so it, it was uh, it was quite unique. I also have mine as the Web Commander 
um, you know, but you're right. They, they do, they do bring back each of those coins that I have that I units that I served with are, are more important than, and than, than just the other coins I have a various unit. I mean, I have the ones that I, the units I served with all the, all the way, they go all the way back, uh, uh, with, with, you know, until the, the, when I first came in, I think we, I don't know when we started getting coins, but they do a lot of them bring back memories of, of fellow Marines that you served with. And that's one thing that, that the Marine Corps has different than most other, most, most other services. <clears throat> we were the first ones, Marine is capitalized with a big M, not a small M. Uh, now we do that with sailors, but that was an initiative for the Marine Corps, not with not with the Navy. The Marine Corps started that first. I mean, they started out with, with calling sailors with a capital S. But we also, we pride ourselves, even even the commandant of the Marine Corps pride ourselves of being called a Marine. You know, you know, if you go into the, uh, you know, some of the other services, you know, like an Air Force officer, he, he doesn't really consider himself a, an airman. You talk about an airman, you're, you're talking generally about a enlisted enlisted. Listed man, but when when you, I still meet up with some of my Marine friends. And they say, "How are you doing today, Marine?" You know, and you take that as a compliment, whether you're private or whether you're the commandant of the Marine Corps. Being called a Marine is is something that you pride yourself on. Mm -hmm. And for me, it, it it something I don't know talk about a lot in the podcast, but for my my journey, like I spent the first ten years actually avoiding being connected with the Marine Corps. It was something that I, I just felt like I didn't get where I wanted to go through it. And I, so I just kind of ran from the whole identity and people figured it out. It was fine, but it took me starting a side gig to really figure out to face my, my, my veteran, my Marine Corps inner inside me and really dive into what this podcast is now of me head face in with the Marine Corps in with every branch of service, helping them become great dads. But it, it's often something we forget. And this coin has really helped me in all of these times throughout my life now that in the last six months of just remembering that whatever you're feeling, I'm more than that. And like something as Marine, there is something there. I actually, when I first started carrying this, I did a meditation exercise and I visualized this massive amount of light coming towards me in the, over the sunrise. And I envisioned that light as every Marine that's come before me. And I visualized it hitting my chest and flowing through my arm into the coin. And so now as I think about that, moment and I think about the energy that I have visually packed into this coin, I have everybody that came before me. And that's going back to what we Marines have is that we're always Marine, every Marine going back to 1776, we're all in this together. And we've all been trying to do it together. And you have that strength in you the moment you were in that title. Very good analysis and why, you know, very good points. I, I think that that's true for a lot of Marines. I mean, they, it's, it's, you know, the, the feeling of, you still feel like you, sometimes there's another part of you when you're pretty able to grasp that coin. So, I mean, I don't carry one with me all the time, but uh, I'll be honest with you. A lot of times when I go to a uh, either a speaking arrangement or something that's a, a meaningful event, I will put one in my pocket and I will, I will carry it with me. So, Well, Joseph, I really have loved this conversation. It's not very too often that I, I get a Marine to uh, reminisce with and talk about. And we both, something I didn't mention earlier, we were both on Okinawa during the same time when you were the uh, commanding officer for Camp Butler. And so I instantly recognized your name when you came up on my radar, and I was like, I got to talk to him. And I, I just loved having this conversation. We've talked about a lot of different things, and I'm positive that we hopefully we gifted some of your depth and wisdom to dads out there to help them come home. I just want to ask one final thing. If you want to gift a piece of advice for dads, one piece of advice to make sure they get from your life into their life, what's that one piece of advice that you want to leave for military dads? That would be, I think you have to have your priorities uh, in order. You, you need to make sure you've, you've looked at your inner self um, you know, and, and, and decided you have to uh, prioritize, you know, what's, what's important. Um, and, you know, a lot of times I, I would, I, I would gather particularly by Sergeant Major or, uh, senior enlisted and my senior officers together, try to talk to them about what are their priorities. And I would al always, you know, somebody who always has the Marine Corps first, if that's what he says, or your job first, 
if they're being truthful with you, and, and sometimes they are, then that's a dangerous situation for both him and and the, and and the organization. So your your priorities, you know, your family and your children uh, have to be your your first priority. And if you get that out there, there was a uh, a guest that we just had recently in the podcast, and he said it beautifully that if your family is not the first priority there will be casualties. It's almost a certainty and you can buy time and you can try to hide and you can try to act, but eventually that comes home to roost and there will be casualties. So if, if anybody wants to connect with you or follow you, is where's the best place to hang out with you? I, I would say to connect with me through uh, my LinkedIn profile. They can, you know, punch me up on LinkedIn and uh, 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 that's the easiest way to connect with me uh, to begin with. And, and then from there, they can contact me directly through LinkedIn. That's, that's easy to do. Well, I've appreciated your time. I know your time is valuable. So I, I want to just honor this friendship because it's we, we never knew each other in the beginning, but I feel like we're just getting started here in this time frame of our lives. And so I'm excited to continue our friendship and uh, see where it goes. Thank, thank you, Ben, and, and good luck to you and, and uh, be safe. Thank you. Thank you for guys for listening for another episode of Military Veteran Dad. I hope you enjoyed that episode just as much as I did. I wanted to share with you some of the key takeaways that I talk, took away from that episode. One of the things I loved, great memory, we, we were talking a lot about the core memories, about his story, about golfing. I really thought that was something that I'm going to keep in the back of my head as I go into my journey of being a dad because there are so many moments where I say no and I really probably should have said yes. And those moments are probably the ones that are going to be core memories where they're going to want something to hold on to as a memory to remind you by. But then also at the same time, like just making sure that I'm out there doing different things like going golfing, doing things that like outside the norm of the the day-to-day stuff around the house. And it's so easy to get caught up in the flow of things that is life in 2020. But at the same time, we need to make sure we're doing things that are outside of that zone because it's outside that zone where these core memories happen. And so that was one of my big, big takeaways from Joseph's episode here. And the meaning behind those challenge coins, that was really something cool where we talked about and I shared my story and then he also shared his story. I really enjoyed kind of reminiscing that and talking about what those coins mean to Marines and how we use them in our day-to-day life. And I was also excited to hear that he also still uses it his, in the same way that I do and carries it around in his pocket when he goes to do big things in life. Because there's so many things in our lives today that we just don't often honor or we don't recognize that we're capable of and we kind of pull back. And having that kind of anchor in your pocket is a great way that I use for myself in order to keep moving on different things and to keep myself anchored and going forward But more importantly, you just have the strength to keep going. So without further ado, I'm going to wrap up this episode. I hope by the time I talk to you on Friday, you get the full Ben Cloy back without the sinus infection. And with that, I will talk to you guys again on Friday.